This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Unpropertied. Property, the dominion of human needs, represents the stronghold of man's enslavement and all the horrors it entails. Emma Goldman, in her text, Anarchism, what it really stands for. In W.E.B. Du Bois' impressively encyclopedic Black Reconstruction, an essay toward a historic a history of the part of which Black folk played in the attempt to reconstruct democracy in America, 1860 to 1880, he cites Hermann Kriege, a German-American revolutionary and proto-socialist who, incidentally, opposed the abolition of slavery. In 1846, he advocated land reform and free soil, yet also that same year made clear his opposition to abolishing slavery on the grounds of property rights. He is quoted thusly, that we see in the slavery question a property question which cannot be settled by itself alone, that we should declare ourselves in favor of the abolitionist movement if it were our intention to throw the republic into a state of anarchy, to extend the competition of quote-unquote free working men beyond all measure and to depress labor itself to the last extremity that we could not improve the lot of our quote-unquote black brothers by abolition under the conditions prevailing in modern society but make it infinitely worse to the lot of our white brothers so to say that we believe in the peaceable development of society in the United States and do not, therefore, here at least see our only hope in the condition of the extremist degradation. That we feel constrained, therefore, to oppose abolition with all our might despite all the importunities of sentimental Philistines and despite all the poetical effusions of liberty-intoxicated ladies." The passage is dense with assumptions, implications, and slights. Krieg suggests rightly that the quote-unquote slavery question is one in part of property. Enslaved people were themselves property, disallowed personhood. Such a history is imperative to bring to anarchist theorizations, as one cannot assert the ills of private property without noting that not only is the factory or storefront over there property, but there are people who have historically been property, and the descendants of those people, or those who might optically or politically politically be placed in proximity to those people, are living with the effects of, as it were, property's afterlife. Krieg is right in a slanted way. The question of property at the base of slavery cannot be settled by itself alone. But because in the context of anarchist argumentation, it must account for racialized populations and, as I must also argue, gendered domestic and interpersonal labor. Krieg continues, abolition for him has the inevitable end result of anarchy, which is then equated with the negative and unnecessary competition with the quote unquote free working men or free working white men and to devalue their hard-working labor. To abolish slavery would to be effectively, at least in part, to abolish a substantive sector of property ownership, an anarchist move, one might say, so it is opposed in order to sustain the labor value of white men. It is the quote-unquote white brothers who will suffer acutely if slavery were abolished. It is the quote-unquote white brothers who do not want to see abolition or anarchy succeed. Implicit in anarchism's inverse is the maintenance of property and the state with its attendant vertical relationality, which maintain white labor. Anarchism's abolitionist spirit then, at its foundation in the U.S., the emancipatory results of getting closer to freeing black people. Put differently, I read anarchism's abolitionist spirit here as an anarcho-blackness. Interestingly, Krieg, or Krieg is purportedly motivated by a sense of keeping the peace, which serves as the opposite of anarchy. White rule equals peace, black freedom equals chaos, or the word he goes on to use, degradation. To degrade something is to cheapen. 
And this bears a link to another term we might meditate on usefully, as we briefly did in the chapter before, destitute. To destitute something is to impoverish it, to extract its value. The degradation that would ensue post-abolition, the destitution that would take hold is necessary in order to free the revolutionary imaginary of all the old constituent fantasies that weigh it down of the whole of the deceptive legacy of the hegemonic logic of the white and cis male supremacy woven into the West's capitalist state. What Krieg is afraid of is precisely the aim of black anarchism. The extreme degradation, the thoroughgoing destitution of the world and that which sustains it. Classical anarchist sentiment is clear on the point that depriving the world of the, of the things that sustain the accumulation of capital is one of the chief goals for anarchist world making. A further point, however, is how fundamental anarcho-blackness is to this. For the things that have had a significant impact on capitalism's expansion have been racial enslavements, accumulation of free black labor. This is to see as necessary the constant affixation of, a, of racial to capitalism. Abolition is always both abolition of racism slash white supremacy and capitalism. And finally, Krieg's offhanded, seemingly hand-waving concluding comment abolition is to be opposed certainly for the aforementioned reason of leaving intact the current conditions of labor as the province of white men but further it is to be opposed despite and because it is supported by both sentimental philistines and interestingly liberty intoxicated ladies is krieg embarrassed about supporting abolition in any way because were he to do so He'd not only be sentimental, but likened to a lady. Both of these might, in fact, have a common thread, that of femininity. Underlying Krieg's opposition to abolition, his opposition to anarchy, is its support by things that connote femininity, which is to say, anarchy's latent and spectral femininity. More, a femininity that is liberty-intoxicated. This movement away from the feminine is no coincidence, as there might be said to be a feminine character to resistance, as Cedric Robinson claims, that there is or might be a feminine character to resistance that, quote, all resistance in effect manifests in gender, manifests as gender, that resistance itself is gendered, is also con con concatenated with the black radical tradition, not simply in that we are discussing abolition of slavery in the U.S., but also because that tradition utilizes gender for liberatory aims. See, for example, Harriet Tubman's flouting and revising of gender to engender others' freedom. That tradition, like this resistant aspect of gender, quests for freedom, which is the aim of resistance. And to be intoxicated with liberty, to refuse enslavement, one must seek the abolition too. Of property. What is property? There is, of course, the definition of property as a state protected monopoly over resources or privileges that are then deployed to others' exploitation. Example to own land and then to rent that land to others for one's own profit. But there is also the sense of property as an essential or peculiar characteristic of a thing. Anarchism seeks then to remove the private ownership of property that sustains capital accumulation. Black anarchism must consider both senses by way of acknowledging and forming a politicized movement around the fact that the history of blackness is testament to the fact that there are some whose property or essential characteristic was property, an ownable thing. To approach the matter of property Things divorcing the owner from the user, from the perspective of black anarchism, from an anarcho-blackness, is to begin from the assumption that to let go is a kind of salvific grace. To clarify, letting go points to a willingness to leap in that Kierkegaardian sense, to immerse oneself in, one might, in what one might be. 
I offer these notes toward a black anarchism with precisely this yearning for what might be possible, a world unfettered by ontological and epistemological straitjackets or by structural and dominative oppressions. Uncertainty is endemic to this anarchism, wanting that without knowing what it will be, but understanding it as an anarchic salvation precisely because it is not this. Property has at its base the thorough holding on and possessive spirit of its owner, an encompassing knowingness of the property possessed. To rebuke privatized ownership and property is to then let go and allow the possibility of something and some way else to be, to, oddly enough, take hold. But what of this term, anarchism? Some in recent years have deployed it in ways that in fact deify possession and property. I want briefly to address how there is or how there has been attempts to use anarchist language for non-anarchist ends. While it is thorny territory to attempt to parse good anarchism and bad anarchism, it is perhaps necessary in order to best stave off co-option. This becomes all the more important on the topic of property, as it can sometimes be language fraught with conflations and misinterpretations. For instance, certain right-wing capitalists and corporate fat cats seek deregulated access to unhindered capital accumulation, claiming to be disrupting the ethos of taxation and quote-unquote liberating us from impediments to massive wealth. Ownership of private property is seen as a way to stick it to an authoritarian government, and anarchists have a founding tenet of anti-authoritarianism. So look at us being quote-unquote anarchists with our multi-million dollar vacation homes. They claim the label anarchist, as do the oxymoronic so-called anarcho-capitalists. How should one respond? We must do more than simply note that there is an eclectic array of anarchic strands, communist, syndicalist, libertarian, socialist, anarcho-feminist, primitivist, individualist, insurrectionary, vegan. Such an anything goes strategy potentially dilutes the ability to root out the dangerous political relations supported by something like (laughs) anarcho-capitalism. The goal here is not to create an ironclad, unbreachable, unbending definition of anarchism that allows fluidity, flexibility, and different textures. That would employ a spirit of governance hostile to what might lie outside of anarchism's tenets, making it unable to think the unthought. So how to proceed? There are strands of individualist anarchism, for example, that amount ultimately to get your hands off my property. <laughs> There are also capitalist ideologies that have borrowed, or stolen, the label anarchist to describe deregulated access to financial wealth. Both, however, operate on an incredibly regulated internality. The space the latter wishes to occupy may seem ungovernable and thoroughly deregulated, but it is predicated on highly regulated and exclusionary and hierarchical with its racial, gendered, and classed valences or criteria. The purported deregulated space is enabled by extreme regulation of who might access that space. Two, when not constituted by the literal wage of capitalism's master wage-slave dialectic, they are defined by the implicit wages of whiteness, which garner a kind of capital on the grounds that they have provided access to the territory, economies, and uninhibited assumptions that allow for such an anarcho-capitalism. Better stood as a minarchist position or wanting minimal government that retains cops and armies but eradicates, say, social welfare. That of cis masculinity, which not only grants a sense of entitlement to any and all spaces slash territories, but also is the subjectivity that underwrites access to the very subjective tenets upon which self-possession rests, and that of heteropatriarchal conquest, accumulating and consuming bodies for reproductive means, whether that of cis white women to create generations of conquerors and ensure the purity of whiteness, 
or that of cis black women to claim ownership and violation of a sentient reproductive object to further wealth and a fungible human labor. Fundamental to this bad anarchism is an obsession with security and possession. Anarcho-blackness or black anarchism provide a rejoinder to this. To inhabit a world on anarchic grounds is to inhabit necessarily an unsafe neighborhood because safety and security are characterized by an implicit constitutive whiteness that allows for safety and in fact serves as the obverse of abolitionist liberation. Recall Krieg who opposed abolition and black emancipation to protect white laboring men. Security necessitates biometric regulations that work to the detriment of gender non-normativity, femme and feminized bodies, and bodies of color which may or may not be adorned with racialized and thus suspect accoutrements. See, for example, the turban, the turban or the afro. What the advi- advancement of anarcho-blackness puts forth is recognition of how histories of gender and racialization underpin capitalist notions of security and possession. I want to argue for what J. Cameron Carter and Sarah Jane Servanak called parapossession as anarcho-blackness's relationship to property. In Black Ether, Carter and Servanek tie blackness to an ethereality that, following Nathaniel Mackey, announces a kind of holding without having. How to hold but not have. Such an outlook is all the more pressing when shifting from an understanding of possessive relationships with things to a possessive relationships with people. Though again, it cannot be elided that historically there have been people understood as things. This interstitial space between property and grasplessness, this parapossession, is an attempt to maintain mutuality in which one can care for and share affinity with others without needing to possess them, without needing to own them as one's own. Similar to anarchist distinctions between property as organized around a sovereign lord who uses propertized objects to exploit others, and possession as a rooted in use rights or usufruct rather than exploiting others, parapossession builds on this history. Parapossession allows for I am relating to this now in a particular, perhaps singular way, in the rubble of this is mine. It is a being and becoming with and through, as opposed to a I am garnered by the refusal of the other. Black anarchists who move toward inhabiting an anarchic world become through a subjectivity that constitutes them via this holding without having. Their subjectivity becoming that of being, quote, held in non-coalescence against worldly misholding. End quote. This anarchism is to practice non non prepossessive, a plum in the spirit, and this caressing and holding that subverts the propertied possessiveness of having, is Black Lives experimentalism, a fence breaking, boundary crossing, para theological, para ontological in sovereign, paralegal, and parapossessive ambulation. Black life, which Carter and Servanek understand not only as the material conditions that apportions life's vagaries amongst black people, but as a general liveliness, a pervasive and infectious ether that is blackness, is the givenness of parapossession and holding in a way that does not commit to having to ownership. Reading Anarcho as a getting outside and away from sovereignty and blackness in the aforementioned way, black anarchism is constituted by an anarcho-blackness that resides in, builds life within a parapossessive, insovereign, fence-breaking space. This is the world anarcho-blackness yearns for.
It emphasizes mutual aid and care and joy by a collective assemblic relationality predicated on something more flexible than privatized ownership. Indeed, fence breaking leads to a society that is much more open and mutually caring. The anarcho of blackness and black anarchism in general demands a more philosophical unholding from property as well. What I am asserting here is a black anarchism that inducts the denizens of an anarchic society into unpropertied relationship with one another because property moves through relationality just like the state. So if blackness's anarchic character defines this, the demand placed upon those who seek an anarchic society is a becoming black where blackness is what happens to you when anarchism takes hold of you. Carter and Servanac again, quote, This is all to say that the, this ethereal movement, otherwise black movement, unheld by its ambulations into music alongside unavailable dreams, de-aggregates blackness from its entrenchment with state interest, with property, and with this world's holdings. End quote. The racialized blackness one usually understands as blackness as such is embedded in the logics of state and property. Thus to be and become unpropertied, to be moved by the anarchic, is to disaggregate blackness from this relationship. And if we wish for an anarchic society, which is to say an unpropertied and unstated world, blackness becomes adhesive for those who refuse the state's holdings over us we demand the impossible yes and that impossible is a way to live without being owned and without owning a way to be done with properties and the private without giving up sensibilities of holding and relating in specific idiosyncratic ways is what we want in contrast to the colonial and imperialist drive to capture and claim as one's own characterized by an expanse of masculine whiteness that subjugates bodies of color and uses rape of the feminized people as a propelling force for colonization the anarchism of blackness as williams and samudzi would say demands a new beginning that has as its precipitating force the end of this the anarchism of blackness indexes an unpropertied relationship to the world and others in as much as it discloses the impropriety of freedom, freedom's unboundedness, which is to say its inability and unwillingness to demarcate the limits of sanctioned relationality or to propertize. The imperialist settler colonial drive is manifested in the white self-possession whiteness as property par excellence so blackness comes to unpossess itself in order to become unbounded by the property the heteropatriarchal racial and gendered capitalisms rest at the heart of the will to possess and privatize the ownership of possessable things thus anarchism demands its abolition not a conciliatory reform for it is impossible to reform the system of racial capitalism the capitalist demand for property and its ownership by those in power recognizes only gluttony and the necessity for exploitation to maximize that gluttony's expansion this theft is of the first order and to move toward anarchic life is to steal on the second order to steal back and let free what is unownable indeed property and capitalism have deemed the stealing back a negative connotated theft without recognition of its own theft but we are on to that old tired smoke screen we know what's really up. We've known for a while. We've known in the final instance that as the 17th century folk poem goes, the law locks up the man or the woman who steals the goose off the common, but leaves the greater villain loose who steals the common from the goose. Poor and wretched don't escape if they conspire the law to break. This must be so, but they endure those who conspire to make the law. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.